to my personal page. Yeah, uh, yeah unless I was you don't want him your, to. On your page that has the uh, banner, Free Our Elders, Parole Justice. Unless you don't want him to. We lost his audio. Your audio is off or something. I muted myself. Oh, yeah, that's okay. fine. Oh. So that's okay with you. Good. It's good. Well, we, it's, it'll be just under an hour. Are you sure right, that's quicker, good? The quicker it can end, the better. So let's, let's, get it, let's get it started. I'm setting it up with Facebook. Okay, Facebook is happy that we're not putting out any misinformation. They said we're, we're good to go. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay. okay, flip the switch. Is the light on over your shoulder? Yes. Put the clapper in front of your face. When you hit the clapper, you're on the air. Welcome, welcome to Talking Peace with uh, the Western New York Peace Center and in this case also um, the Interfaith Peace Network. Um, being recorded here with Richard Wicca as our producer here at Think Twice Radio in the home of the future. So thanks, Richard. Thanks for producing. And uh, I'm your host, Vicki Ross. I'm very excited to be here. I do still work with the Western New York Peace Center as the Human Rights and uh, Peace Education Chair and also very excited as the, um, the a consultant for the Interfaith Peace Network. So we cover a lot of uh, territory, but I, I don't, we don't cover nearly as much territory as our guest here, uh, Christian Para. Hi, Christian. What's up, y'all? I, 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 I'm just excited that you managed to squeeze us in, in between your, um, uh, your organizing and activism over so many um, counties and probably states, you know. <laughs> I, I know you're very, very busy, right? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely been traveling a lot, um, doing trainings in Massachusetts. Probably going to go to the Bay in the next couple of weeks or three weeks. Um, to do a training there. I've been doing trainings in New York City, Binghamton, um, Rochester. About to do one, I think, in two weeks in Hudson Valley. So it's definitely been, um, you know, different since I've become a state organizer for citizen action around civil justice so, issues. So I was about to to get to that of like, yes, that you are the state a statewide organizer for citizen action. Um, you are also. Um, I, I, I can't help mentioning one of my favorite groups, Free the People Western New York, that you actually founded and co-organized. Um, so I, I feel like you do an awful lot for this community here, as well as lots of communities everywhere. So I just want to ask you, first of all, I, I can't help asking, the Bay means San Francisco or? Um, Richmond, or Richmond, California. Richmond, California. Oh. Yeah, I don't even know where that is. Where is that? Is that near San Francisco? Or that is correct. Right. It's next door right, to right, San Francisco. Right, right, right. Anyway, so yeah, you're really getting around lately, and I know you just sandwiched us even at this late hour in between meetings. So, uh, so we're we're glad to have you. And I want to, I, I want, I we have a really interesting topic, I think, um, and it's really sort of in honor of the work that you're doing in combination with, we just, I just finished doing a talking piece um, with Deidre, Emel, um, Wayne, Alt, and uh, Chuck Culhane, all of the Western New York Peace Center, where we were talking about some Western New York um, activists and organizers, um, peacemakers and, and justice, uh, uh, justice fighters, just fighting for justice. Um, so I, it made me think about leadership and um, organizing and some of the work you're doing around, you know, building a base. And certainly the Peace Center has been very involved in movement building in a, probably in somewhat of a different way. So I thought it, that would be a good topic for us for right now. So first, if you wanted to, if you think about leadership, um, what do you see as some of the most important characteristics for a leader? The first thing I would say is vulnerability, um, making sure that um, we try to figure out the self-interest of individuals. Vulnerability? Um, to understand. Is that what you said, vulnerability? Or Yeah, that is 
Correct, mm-hmm. vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Um, right? As a leader, we need to lead by example by telling our stories of how we've been oppressed mm-hmm. um, and systems that have been fixed to oppress us in our communities. So by, by, by generating leaders, they have to teach other leaders on how to find that vulnerability to tell their story as well so that we can make data a real thing. We tie the stories to data. That's why we need think tanks. But when we talk about leadership development, is to find people that feel like victims or you know survivors to create chaos in communities um, that need change. And then we tie policy into that work um, to change the laws and policies and talk to our elected officials, teaching people how to lobby um, also teaching people how to do petitioning um, for laws or petitioning for even some to get somebody on the ballot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then knocking on doors, um, phone banking, everything that is necessary in order to make change. Mm-hmm. The thing is, we need to try to find healing for those that are have been impacted. And that's by winning and making change so that our next generation doesn't have to feel that, which is our kids. It's like, what are we actually building? Um, this is not about clout. Um, The goal is to try to make as many people powerful as possible and also to create a spider web of people that's from Buffalo because I'm not from here. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. So it's like, how do I, in my mind, um, see a connection? Like even with Free the People and seeing a whole bunch of people connecting together, seeing Pushing Latinos Forward, the people's machine, which is going to be coming out soon, um, and just seeing the, the, the next generation, the next administration um, taking over as millennials, Um, and then the Generation Z that's going to come after that. So we just need to make sure that we have the right education, popular education, political education, to teach our kids um, that they are the next generation to take over politics. Um, Not just politics, but the governance in general um, of our future. You know, it's interesting to me when you started off with vulnerability, and, you know, I, I think that's so key, and I saw it as a different reason in a way, is that when you, the vulnerability is also about trust building and humanity the con- and connecting with people, right? So, which is really, again, you know, trust building, that we really connect with people that, you know, that we're, you know, becoming one um, and uh, collaborating, you know, so that it's shared leadership and shared vulnerability, right? So, um, yeah. So I, I totally, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to cut you off, Vicky, no, but no, go ahead. the vulnerability and, and to build relationships because we can't build power with people that we don't trust. Right. Because we we're talking about like grant money coming in. We're talking about the different scenarios that can break people up because people get envy of people building power. Um, they'll try to b- build dominant narratives to separate us because they see what's being built. Right. Uh, people get people get scared, and some people even feel left out. Right. Um, and um, we can't feel like that. We're not here to be. be li- we're not here to be liked. We're here to build power. Right. Um, and and some people just don't get that. And it and it takes it takes like they say it takes a village to make change. Um, but but sometimes people let the dominant narrative separate us, and and we have to understand that we need to try to find restorative practice um, in a way that we do find peace and love and healing in a space whenever there's tension because we don't have time to let people separate us at this moment, especially um, during a pandemic, but not just the pandemic of coronavirus, a pandemic of homelessness. Um, what's about to happen um, in the next, you know, it's already happening. Um, the, the rates of... Um, evictions are happening right. super, super fast. And I've seen it. It's being done in Rochester, Hudson Valley, Binghamton. Mm. It's being done around the whole entire mm. state. Imagine the country. So it, this is a time that we need to unite through tensions um, and break those tensions and try to find a way to um, find restorative practice in everything that we do. Well, it's again, you're reminding me of another word that I bet you're going to connect with that is related to all of that. So in terms of leadership, in terms of authenticity, right? 
because that's the other thing because ego can get in there or something and back to the trust thing or 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 the shared power thing it, then that means that the leaders well it makes me think of gandhi actually gandhi said you know a true leader is a servant of all and in terms of being authentic you know you have to uh, lay your ego down you know, to be a, a good leader, to be a good leader. I, you can be a leader and be up there all puffed out, and I, I don't want to mention any of the bad examples that we've seen, and there are a plenty because the ego gets fed like a bonfire, and that's when the leadership may have started off with some real authenticity, may have started off with some real genuine caring, and then the, the ego has taken over and um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So that's where the authenticity, and Gandhi was one who actually, when he wrote his autobiography, wrote all these things about his failings and his his weaknesses and um, his mistakes, and people said, why are you doing that? Don't do that. Are you crazy? You know, and he's like, no, this is what has to be in here. This is, this is what's needed for a leader, you know, and that's that's just what you said, back to the vulnerability, making yourself vulnerable, owning up to your mistakes, being a good role model, being a good friend, you know, being somebody that can be depended on and counted on. Yeah, like I, I dealt with a lot of narratives because the fact that, you know, Citizen Action didn't endorse India Walton. Um, and, you know... Really? You know, and, and I've been trying my hardest, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, for that to happen and to see the leadership development that's being done through her campaign and the healing that's being done through her campaign has been historic. Um, right. and, and, you know, people are, are, are being uplifted in movement politics right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, the last show that I was actually on was with her and, uh, on, on this show. Um, and you know, really, <laughs> I, I'm just glad that I'm able. I'm, I'm just glad that I'm able to help out with the Working Families Party as a member, um, mm. which I think people should join. We should be uplifting the Working Families Party because we also seen what the Democratic Party did um, by even excluding, you know, India Walton to have the Working Families Party line. Right. Um, and we we need to uplift the 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 empowerment that we're getting from the different organizations that are putting, you know, their foot down. Um, to show, like, we, we, we're we trying to be as progressive as possible. Right. Um, and, you know, there, there's organizations that sometimes hurt. And it's not that they do it intentionally. It's just the fact that they are moving in, in a way that they're writing the work rather than doing the work. And, and, and th that's problematic. So I want to say, first of all, I need to say the Interfaith Peace Network, 501c3, uh, under the Riverside Salem umbrella, by the way, Riverside Salem, um, United Church of Christ and uh, Disciples of Christ. So so the IPN is a 501c3, the uh, inter, uh, excuse me, the Interfaith Peace Network is a 501c3, and the um, Western New York Peace Center is 501c3 also. But one of the things that I see is that, uh, first of all, so a 501c3 is not allowed to have an opinion, right? Well, of course, Citizen Action is a 501c4, right? And it has a 3 and a 4, doesn't it? I know It has a 4. Our, our C3 four. Is, a, is AQE. Oh, okay. I should have known that. I should have known that, and we should have been yeah, more, more involved. Yeah, Alliance for Quality Education. We should yeah. be more involved with AQE than we have been. It's just a question of bandwidth. I think they're great. I think the work is so important, and education is absolutely critical. No question. Yeah, they did actually a press conference today about um, the the school to prison pipeline. Really? And like, how do we make sure, like, you know, we 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 are building some type of system so that kids are not falling into a system um, because the fact that the education system doesn't give a real solution, right? They, they suspend kids rather than actually doing restorative practice. Right. Um, and we need to change that immediately because it, it is impacting a lot of kids, even kids that we know. Right. Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. So, but what, anyway, what I was going to say is one of the things that happens is First of all, I think that there are people are individuals. So we, as individuals, for example, I am a, I am now um, a volunteer at 
at, at a number of organizations, and especially the two, the the one that I just mentioned, the Western New York Peace Center. I'm a volunteer there, no longer an employee, and I consult for five hours a week with the Interfaith Peace Network. So I'm allowed to be a person, you know, um, and to to do what I do politically, but. Um, I also think that there are people who are in uh, 501c3s who will go one way or another um, based on, you know, a lot of times, you know, money talks. So I'm going to say that there's a reason why power structures are the way they are and why they're so fixed in place, why incumbents have the strength that they have, and one of them is that is that there's really not an equal playing field in our political system. And the things that we need to do to have um, a true democracy are yet to be done. And so, in fact, there's all kinds of ways that our democracy fails. Um, and then there's actually there's more plans afoot to make it even worse. So we have some real, real uh, serious Issues. I mean, we we did get a boot off of our neck, at least somewhat, in the past year, a little bit. But it was just a little bit of more breathing room. But it doesn't mean it's over, and it doesn't. It's far from meaning that we don't still have serious problems with our democracy. And I know you know that better than anybody. Um, so in terms of, uh, so we're talking, we've talked a little bit about leadership and um, maybe if we go to, uh, well, first of all, when we talk like personally, so a leader, we talked about personal characteristics, but also about an organizer and about an activist. So where are the similarities and the differences there? What would you say? Well, organizer breaks down issues. Uh -huh. um, an orga organizer understands, and it's not that activists don't understand because I'm an activist for an organizer, but sure. I did have to learn the difference. Mm -hmm. um, That's why we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and an organizer is also more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, they write down their strategy charts um, to figure out who their targets are, mm -hmm. what are the tactics that need to be used, um, starting with lobbying or even escalation to direct action. Mm -hmm. um, like when we say, like, protest the power, um, it's more they have a reasoning of why they are doing acts of activism. Compared to straight activism, um, people are angry because Daniel Krug got killed by the police, because Pito got killed by the police. So they're going to react. Meech got killed by the police. We reacted because we want accountability, but we need to make sure that we have it on paper and right. to make sure that the mayor, that the governor, that Tish James, you know, um, the attorney general, that there's different accountabilities that we need to, I mean, there's different people that have seats of power, elected officials, um, that we need to speak to in order to try to make change, but we need to put it on paper and exactly what does that look like. For instance, um, Cario's law, mm -hmm. um, you know, the duty to intervene. We got it. That was, that was organized, yeah. right? It right. went from activism, it went from a lot of activism to being truly organized. Right. You know, I think about people like Drea or Felicia Doe, um, like, you know, two entrepreneurs and, and also in the nonprofit world, too. Um, people that really embraced um, Cario when she got to the point of organizing her campaign. Right. Um, that wasn't it, it became that it wasn't even the activism, but the activism lit it. It lit it. And, it, and also what lit it was the Black Lives Matter movement um, last summer. Um, and just seeing um, what police were doing when everybody staying home and watching the news because of the pandemic. And it, it was an awakening um, for activism to show out. Um, but we need to make sure that when we um, understand activism, that we tunnel that vision into self-interest. And we start telling our story and start realizing that we need to put that data together and create policies from the stories in order to make change. And once policies are created, then we have to talk to the, if it's city, then we talk to the city council, or if it's the county, then we talk to the legislators. If it's a state issue and we have enough organizations throughout the state, coalition work, um, to actually organize all of the different organizations 
to lobby their state elected officials, whether if that's state assembly or state senate. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it gets to like even the federal level um, and talking to our Congress. So to me, it depends on like when we talk about organizing and how we break down issues to create policies and put things into law, um, like Cario's law. And it wasn't about duty intervening activism without paper anymore. It was the fact that we wanted the city council to sign off on Cario's law, and it happened. And then the mayor had to sign it because there was a majority vote. Even though it took him a while, um, he did it. And um, Cario put a lot of effort. And even though Cario told me that there were still things that they took out, and we need to make sure that there is more accountability. So that's why, you know, it's important that we keep our elected officials accountable, and that's by us voting, which is the number one thing in leadership development, is how do we make sure we are putting the right people in office to make the change that right. is necessary for those most impacted? So um, one of the things, I, when I think about organizing and activism, in my mind, it's almost, so it's absolutely what you said about planning, degree of planning could be a big variable. And the other thing I think of is like the active the activist is doing it and the organizer is planning it for other or with other people. You know, so it's about other people. So getting other people involved. Now, activists could be getting other people involved, should be getting other people involved. Maybe, you know, a lot of people are both activists and organizers and that's where that that uh, leadership thing can be merging, or or people can have a different mix and match on those three roles. It may be depending on the issue, the particular event, the time and place, or whatever. But you know, you know what I'm saying about it. Seems like that that piece of it is also in there. So yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think um, activism starts from anger. You know, when, when, when someone right. is dealing with police brutality, um, their family gets upset and they never did organizing a day of their life, but they're upset and now they're getting on the news and people are standing next to them. Um, some of them are doing it for good reasons. Some of them are doing it for clout, um, right. just because they want to become an elected official or just because they want to be seen as an organizer. Um, an organizer really works from behind the scene um, and, and, and putting those that are impacted in the front. Um, to make sure that they're able to tell their stories. Um, organizing is definitely very difficult um, because it comes with a lot of trust and that vulnerability that we talked about at first. Right. You know, it makes me think, too, um, so you use the good example of Cariel's Law, and we did get it done, and I say we. I think, you know, both of us and lots of other people were very involved in that. And For years. I, well, for, for years. years. <laughs> well, for years means, actually, Cariel... Her incident was in 2006. I moved here in 2007. And I knew her from very early on, not not Im immediately, but somewhere not too far off of the um, the original time that I moved here. Here, there's a buzzing here I just want to try and take care of. Um, oops. It just started. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't hear from this side. Just oh, so good. you know. Okay, good. It's it's done now. It stopped now. Okay, so um, that, but that all those things were going on, and I'm going to say especially the organizing and the activism. So the activism started with the Black Lives Matter, with the being in the street, and all the the commotion, you know, of all kinds that went over that June, July, and continued, and then. You know, it started off with the activism and the organizing and activism. There had been organizing and activism before, but then the activism really, I think everyone felt that between, you know, the whole country, really, there was an, there was an awakening. There was a realization. And so it was an, you know, crisis equal to opportunity. So that activism paired up with the organizing that started to happen, the legal help that started to happen, and really just, it, it just started to, you know, um, get in gear and, you know, and that change was made. And there's still, you know, elements that are needed, like you said, if 
Not every single bit of it came through the way it was supposed to. Also, Buffalo is just one place. Also, the difference between a law and implementation, right, which is yet another thing. So there's a lot of, of different elements, and they need, you know, all of them are needed to make the real changes in, in our, our daily practices, in the way things actually happen, um, in, in the people's behaviors, you know. So, so the laws are one thing, and then the actual implementation of those laws, the practices are another thing. So policy ver versus um, practice. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Another, it's another thorny issue there. And ho back to holding people accountable, as you said. And that comes back to people power. So let's go from that into building the base, right? So that's the phrase you used to me. So then I put, I put it down as part of our discussion. But I'm interested in, so what does that mean? What does that mean, building the base? So for me, um... You know, building the base starts with one-on-ones, what we call an organizing, to figure out people's self-interest. Mm -hmm. First, we have to figure out, like, how to be selfish. And, and, and what I mean by that is, like, vacations, spending time with your kids, um, doing pedicures, whatever it is to take care of yourself. Not mm -hmm. selfishness in a way, I mean, selfishness in a way that is greediness. And then there's selflessness, right? Taking care of the community, taking care of others. Mm -hmm. But we can't caretake everybody. Because we have to take care of ourselves. Right. And then there's self-interest. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are we getting self-interested with the community because we truly understand what they've been through? And it's how do we actually empower them? So through that, we do propositions. Propositions is not just, you know, asking somebody to do something, but putting somebody into a role, a role that actually brings accountability. Uh, um, and from there, they feel involved. They feel like they're in the movement to the point that some of them actually get employed by the nonprofit world um, to do activism work, right? Because it's a privilege to get paid to, to organize. Right. So whenever I see okay. an organizer always complaining, oh, I don't like this organization, no matter what, you're getting paid to organize. It's a privilege. So get it done. Um, and, you know, for me, if we're a paid organizer and we're not empowering the community and get, getting self-interested with the community, we're not organizing. We need to make sure that everybody is working with us um, step by step. And basically from there, after doing propositions, um, making lists of accountability. Um, and, and what I mean by list of accountability, I mean, um, um, I mean like strategy charts um, to make sure that people are taking ownership of things, things like note-taking, things like setting up the lobby visits, um, things like who's writing the policies, um, and, and really strategizing throughout the whole entire, what we call campaigns, um, like Cario's Law or Hot Solitary Confinement or releasing aging people in prison right. or the Community Climate Investment Act and so many different um, campaigns that we are trying to implement um, in legislation so that we are able to... Um, secede and change the worldview of people in our communities to understand that we are living in an extractive economy okay. and that we need to get to a regenerative economy where we think about cooperations, I mean, co-ops, where we're thinking about ownership, um, we're thinking about free energy, um, we're thinking about the ways that um, a community builds um, community wealth. Because there are too many people with generational wealth, um, which becomes the 1%, that becomes very extractive if they're not giving away money. But some of them actually do give away money, right? Because building power, you also have to organize money. And that's right. organizing philanthropists. And philanthropists have generational wealth to the point that they actually give money to nonprofits or to organizations as donations um, with, no, um, with no MOU, which means... Um, basically not putting any accountability towards the money because some grant money has things that you have to um, achieve in order to continue getting the money. Sure. Um, so the thing is, like, you know, and, and when organizing people, we don't just think about um, organizing impacted people. We have to organize millionaires, billionaires. We have to organize the middle class. We have to organize everybody so that everybody is shifting worldview so that when voting comes, we're voting for the right people to empower our communities. 
So when we think about self-interest, that's one question I wanted to um, think about or ask you what, what you think about it. When I think about it, one of the big things, actually, you, I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but when, I, when I'm working with um, kids especially and we do super names, right? Have you heard me talk about that? Super names. So when we do super names, it would be like uh, like caring Christian or, or uh, 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 compassionate Christian, courageous Christian, something like that. Right, so it would start with the C H, or it could be charming Christian. Right, so it starts with the same letter or sound, and something about you. Right, so I I call myself Victorious Vicky when we're doing that, and it's because it's my excuse to bring up this idea that occurred to me that was the key to me learning to like my name. So I never really liked my name as a kid, because it sound because it means the victorious one, Victoria. You know, and it sounded pretty self-centered or, you know, like all about me. And so I, uh, when I realized that the real victory, everybody wins. And so I've used that as like almost like a little, you know, what, what if you want to call it, you know, just a little concept uh, um, generator for kids to understand that really, and for, for people to understand that the real victory, everybody does win. So the people who are winning, who are getting, you know, who are le living off the extractive economy, who are who are um, uh, gathering power and usurping usurping power from others, who are living selfishly or, you know, um, or violently, those people are not winning. They may feel they're winning. They may be getting goods. They may be getting more money, they may be getting more power, but they're not really winning. They're going to be, um, they're going to pay in some kind of way, either because somebody's going to, then somebody who's even bigger and badder is going to come and take away or whatever, but it just doesn't pay. Or even, you know, it's the old what goes around comes around. So in some way, if you're living without integrity, without you know, principles and whatever, you're going to pay one way or another, either, you know, through, you know, natural consequences or, you know, legal consequences or, or moral consequences or even in the next adventure, right? When you have to be accountable for the life you've led here on earth, one kind of way or another, you're not winning, right? There's no winning that. And one thing I'll tell you is, like, the one-on-ones that I have with people that are impacted by oppression mm -hmm. um, and then speaking to somebody that has generational wealth, I want to want them exactly the same way, trying to figure right. out, you know, what was, their, mm -hmm. what was their home like, um, what is their race, uh, what is their class, what is their education, um, what, what was their family like, what was their religion um, and, and so on, and just trying to figure out who they are as a person. Right. Um, this is why, you know, I've built relationships with millionaires, um, billionaires, um, due to the fact that I treat them as if they have a story too, because they do. Right. Um, right. and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean, um, just because they have all this privilege that they have not felt, um, emotional pain because they have. Of but course. I, I, right. I definitely make sure for them to realize how much privilege they actually have. Right. And that's easily by bringing them to the projects in Macaulay Gardens or showing them what happened to Shoreline, losing over 200 families on the west side, mm -hmm. um, or, 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 but, but things that are actually you know, physical that they can actually see right. and also things that they can actually feel and right. seeing real people and the love that they actually have, whether right. if it's in food or just the way that they've grown up. Um, because the thing is that people carry a lot of dominant narratives, especially people that have wealth compared to poor people. Um, you know, they, they mm -hmm. think that they're poor because they didn't work hard enough. But the thing is that a lot of wealthy people, you know, the money trickled down to them. And it's like, how do we get them to understand that that money actually technically doesn't even belong to them because they never earned it. So they actually need to give up some money um, so that they can actually give to poor um, but the thing is just that it takes not just the convincing, it takes to get self-interested with them to make them realize that they need to be part of the movement. Well, you could, I mean, I, I think it's sort of, it's making me think of like, 
milk and its whiteness, they're really the same thing, right? So you could call it self-interest because it's in their self-interest to give, give money, to live differently, or whatever it is. Or you could also call it that it's about people realizing, um, you know, that we're all connected. That, you know, if we, if, if everything is better for everyone, that's better for everyone. So that, 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 that building that, that empathy and compassion in people, helping people to feel that, because if they're not feeling it, it's because of a, a, a feeling, so they're losing. They're losing that feeling of community, of the beloved community that, actually, we just had, we were just doing a talking piece where we were talking about these three, you know, Bob Murphy, Ned Cuddy, and, and, and Jim Whitlock, who all passed away within the past just about a month, just over a month. And these are all people who led beautiful lives because they cared for other people. You know, and they were all in different roles and different times and ways, but they were compassionate people. And that compassion, the you know, it's uh, the more lo the more with love, the more you give, the more you get. And with so many things, the more we give, the more we do for others, the more we feel for others, the more it comes back and enriches our lives, right? So that people, I mean, you could call it self-interest, or you could call it building that feeling of of connectedness or unity or beloved community or, you know, I mean, it's really the same thing. It's that, you know, that. <clears throat> so it's like when I met, when I met, when I met Bob, um, Bob Murphy, mm -hmm. um, I met him in Albany for the first time. I was a volunteer at Push Buffalo. Uh -huh. And um, I went down for the CCPA, the Community Climate Protection Act, which became the CLCPA. Right. That passed in 2019 mm -hmm. um but i believe it was in 2015 um when my activism started um and bob murphy was down there and then i started going to different events and he was consistent at every single event mm -hmm. um to the point that it's like i need to get to know him you know i had a one-on-one -on -one right. with bob right. um find out that he was the father to eve shippens mm -hmm. um and just like seeing of a great man and the fact that he dedicated his life to the struggle Right. Um, he was he was everywhere to be found when it came to activism and organizing, right. um, and he he will be deeply missed, um, yes. and because he was he was so present, mm -hmm. um, and his his spirit will always be with us. That's just a guarantee. Right. Um, Bob will always be with us. Right. Um, you know, people pass away, and it's like you don't even call them mentors until they're gone. But his consistency and your consistency, Vicky. Mm -hmm. Um, is motivation um, to that nobody could even keep up with people like you and Bob. Um, and your consistency shows the love that you actually have for the community, right? You make people, and Bob made people, self-interested into activism and organizing. Because without the consistency of our elders to show us the, the, the path of, of what is the path to our power, um, what does it look like, you know? Um, so... Bob, to me, um, definitely um, was a mentor, um, and, and, and he is definitely watching over us as social justice fighters. Um, he will always be with us. Um, he is now an ancestor that we can pray to, um, right. and, I'm, and I'm just happy to say that he was my friend. And like Eve put in Facebook the other day, Christian, he loved you, and I loved him too. Um, so I, I, I will definitely miss Bob. I will too. I will too, and I want to say uh, it's that that and he did it back to, you know. He did it for the love of the people, for the love yeah. of the community, for the 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 passion, for the 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 justice for people, for the living for for putting people first, for putting people on the planet first, which he always did. He always did. You know, and just that caring, gentle way he did it. Yeah, he even, he was always with Cario as well. Right. He's one of the big um, people that always stood by um, Cario's um, law. Sure. Um, before, you know, we, we, we even made it, you know, the grant that it became. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the campaign that it became right. in 2019. 
Right. Uh, I'm sorry, 2020. But the, the point is that Bob, consistency with everybody, um, nobody could ever even say that he was rude. Like, he was a genuine man. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't want to get too emotional because yeah, I'll start no, crying because no, I, no, I miss No, 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 I don't, yeah. Yeah. I know, I know. Yep, it's hard, it's hard. Except that we, you know, they, they, they're they how we inspire ourselves to, to you know, show to show that kind of compassion, to to take that kind of uh, dedication and and to to live on, you know, do the things that they would do if they were here to do them. You know, do the yep. things that they were doing right along, you know, yeah. And I, and I, that's why I say Bob is with us because right. that consistency that he brought, like, we're, we're, Bob is in us. There's nothing yep. that we could even, like, we can never take that away. Um, if we were ever, because I can say that I was with him at, at least 50 different spaces um, mm -hmm. um, because his consistency was always there, and he was more consistent than that. Right. Well, here's the other thing, though, I want to say, because I think about little Christian, right? So it's also about that. It's about the, you know, and this is from our, our, our indigenous brothers and sisters thinking about the seventh generation. But so for our children or for our children's children or for other people's children and other people's children's children's children, you know, yeah. we think about how, how, what do they need? What are they going to need? What do we need to do so that, so that life will continue in this creation in a way that is, you know, a beautiful thing? Because there is so much beauty in the world if we can keep it. You know, if, yeah. we can, if we can do the things that we need to do. And I do feel that, you know, that you could say it's our self-interest because it's about the people we care about, or mm -hmm. it's not about, or it's about them and our interest for them, you know, that it's about the beloved community that we want to see thrive and happy and and have what they need, you know, yeah. everybody. So- Like um, even in my self-interest is to find people with mental illness and empower them. You know, like for, for me, you know, for someone that was suicidal, mm -hmm. um, and just the fact that I am empowered um, and the fact that I know that I have to have a clear mind now, right. especially because because of my son um, right. and showing him the way. Um, right. And I think about like the Lion King when he's on top of the rocks and the mountain. Yes. And he's like, you don't go to that side. Um, it's, it's the influence that we've become um, for those that um, feel like they don't have hope anymore. But I don't like to give hope. I give empowerment. Right. Um, get people involved. I don't tell people I'm going to help them. I tell them they got to get involved. Exactly. Uh, so it's 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 definitely like my son is definitely my biggest motivation. He's the reason why I'm in Buffalo. Right. Um, and you know, and yeah. So it's it's a lot, and it's you know, my son writes about Black Lives Matter. He wrote about what happened in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. He wrote about me being incarcerated. Um, I, I'm very vulnerable with my son, so he doesn't have to follow any footsteps in the future. Um, but instead, he becomes a role model himself. Right. You know, my, my, I've seen my son do chants in front of 500 people right. when we had to count the votes and Biden won the poll that day. Yeah. And, it, and it's just the whole point of, like, how do we, you know, build that consistency of even educating our youth? Because the school system, the public education system is not going to give our kids the empowerment that they need right after high school. For instance, you don't need a degree in order to run for office. If kids senior year was taught how to um, run somebody for office, a kid could run right after high school for school board because they know what's happening in the schools and they want to see change. The right. thing is just that everybody thinks you need this education because that's the narrative. And I'm not saying don't get your education. Get your education um, so that you can follow the path to your power. But at the same time, Kids should be empowered during high school before they have to even pay for school. Well, one of the things I also think we talk about education is people need to be educated in just what we're talking about. So that's political, that's moral, that's spiritual. So those things are all important things that need to be addressed as well. And the other thing is um, the thinking. Thinking is that, you know, you know, I think that so often in education, kids are not taught to think, to think critically. They're taught to 
parrot back what they were told or to memorize oh. things or things like that. Or, how, you know, even for, as simple as also finding out how to find things out. That's another thing. Yeah. And how to analyze. But that thinking piece that has to be in there and how to communicate that has to be in there so if those things are not in there and it's all about now i'm 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 all in favor of people learning spelling you know and even spelling yeah. which spelling is about to go the way of the dodo i know that but um but the biggest things that people need to learn they need to learn and that's about yeah how connected we all are, what's really important in this life, how to live that life, how to think, how to think things through and understand and uh, not, be, not be tricked, not be lied to, not be mistaken about what's really going on. And also yeah. about how we're all really connected and how that, that back to that every the real victory everybody wins back to that we're not okay until we're all okay because it will yeah. drag us down it's like the weakest link thing on a chain right no but it's it's also the fact of secrecy um when we uh -huh. talked about the first thing was right. vulnerability right right like right. people are sometimes told don't talk about what happens at home don't talk about things because it's oh, private right and and that is actually very oppressive white supremacy wins when we don't tell our story Right. We need to tell our story because it matters. You're and the fact so that, right. that 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 emotional um, trauma um, of whatever is happening in your mind, it needs to be shared. It's not just right. a counselor. We have a whole community that needs to unite. And right. these stories matter. And it's time for everybody to start telling their stories because if they just keep it in their mind, it is going to defeat them. They are not going to feel liberated. So they can't liberate anybody and fight for anybody. They can't even fight for their community because they're living in pain. And the thing is, if we let people live in pain, then that means that they cannot be healed. And we need to find healing space for everybody um, to tell their story. Absolutely. No more secrecy because if not, white supremacy wins. You know, I, I, want, I want to add to that one little piece is sometimes, you know, as a social worker, which I, I am a social worker, we talk a lot about trauma, right? So... Shame is the subtle trauma. So the trauma of feeling shame, like it's my fault, like don't tell anybody, like keep these big secrets. And that's where the, that, that is so traumatizing because with shame, then you're on attack from within. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're given all your bad messages, all these things that have been told to us that we're no good or we should be ashamed or, you know, all these things, those we're, we're being attacked by those thoughts and that is by itself traumatizing. So it's like yeah. really traumatizing. Because so, the thing is, if you don't talk about it, it could continue happening, right? Exactly. And, it, sure. and, and if it continue happening, it's like you could have stopped it at an earlier age. Right. Um, because trauma is super real. And the thing is that yes. it impacts in real ways, especially if it's happening for five years, 10 years, 15 years. And then you finally tell somebody... No, find your liberation as quick as possible. Activism doesn't start because of what's happening in the streets. Activism starts from your own house. Politics starts from your own house. Decision-making right. starts from your own house. Right. You are your own decision-maker in your own ecosystem. So we have to make sure that we understand that politics is not just in City Hall. It no, starts no. from your own home. Right, right. Well, it's about a way of doing things and sh sh sharing power. Sharing power, having power, and sharing power, and um, and and then you know, well, I I I'm gonna say I bring it back to truth and love. So we we need to know the truth about what's happening. So that's back to what we said about analysis, about uh, not lack, uh, not having secrecy. Yes, having authenticity or vulnerability, right? So all those things. And then um, that's the truth. And then the love is the compassion and the sharing mm -hmm. and, the, and the caring for the beloved community and making sure everybody is going to be okay. And that the unequalness is not okay and that the injustices are not going to stand. And back to, as we've seen and as we've said, is that when some groups are, are oppressed and penalized, other groups are too. You know, it's the old... Uh, Oh, oh, what was his name who said the, the thing about, you know, well, first they came for this one, and then I said nothing, and then they came for these ones, and then I said nothing. Ma, what was it? Ma, Ma, 
can't remember his name, but whatever it was, it, it's back to that we're all connected. And injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's what Dr. King said. So he also said, yeah, yeah that unarmed truth, <clears throat> unarmed truth and unconditional love will, I get this from John Washington was the first one I saw quoting that, is Dr. King's thing that he said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is actually, why. yeah. Go ahead. I'm meeting with John Washington right now. You and, um, are. Is he? Yeah, there he's right in the now? room. He's in the yeah. room waiting for you. Well, I know. Now we have about five more minutes. Just five. If you have, you got five more minutes. I know you're. Well, we, I know you're in a big. We can make yeah. it happen. Well, I want to say, John Washington, and then the second part of it is, that is why good, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. And I saw that on the bottom of his email, and then I put it on the bottom of mine. And it's still on the bottom of mine. And I have quoted it so many times in, you know, the oh. Women's March, in different settings, and just to myself for that encouragement. Because that we have to know, and and as activists, as leaders, you know that's got to be a piece of it. Because if we don't have that, that that hope, and that faith, you know, in the truth in love, in 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 in, you know, you can call it God or call it whatever you want. You know, call it call it satyagraha, truth seeking. You know, call it compassion. Call it the beloved community. If we don't believe in those things. We wouldn't even try, right? We just lost before we even start. So we have to have those things. We have to know that yeah. know that they're they're what we need and they're what we're. And that's to. and and that's the key to all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, people will do whatever they can to separate us, but once you build a base of love and healing, um, those stories like stay in, in me forever. I don't ever talk about someone's story in the public arena or in the private arena. That's between me and the individual. Right. Um, but that's what makes us powerful is the relationships that we carry. Right. Um, there's so much love that is um, put in investment um, in the movement. Um, and you start realizing that you don't just ask people to do things. You don't use people in the movement. What you need to do is invest into people's stories right. um, and make them feel like they matter because they do. Right. Um, and it's 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 one of the most difficult things in base building is that some people use people in communities or members that have been active in an organization. But we need to build the relationship with the individuals um, to build a true relationship, because then people will not only are going to work with you, they're going to invest back into you. So when it comes to like that self-interested, once again, um, it goes back and forth. Right. And sometimes arrows, they go both ways. Some arrows might be smaller or bigger in love. Um, some of them might even be bigger on one side and smaller on the other because people love differently because of trauma. Um, and we have to realize that. Right, right. Well, that, that compassion, that caring, that building community, that one love, you know, that's, that, and, and truth. And truth is what's gonna, that's what leavens it, right? So it's not just about love. L truth is got to be in there, and that is the other key element. That so is, truth that about, is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is, that is very accurate, um, right? You've never seen me make a lie. I've never lied to anybody. Um, even if somebody puts a narrative on me, that's not true. Um, my base loves me and knows who I am. Right. Um, because in organizing, um, people can envy in a way because of the way some certain people move. But I've always moved with authenticity. And and, I, and I'm sorry I'm making I statements, but we as a community move with authentic, authenticity. Um, and in the sense of the base that has been built um, and the family that I have created here in Buffalo because I'm not from here. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And the oh, fact that too. I was able to... And the, and the fact that I was able, and you too, and the fact that we're able to build a community around us that loves us um, is priceless. And I think that's what gives me the energy to continue doing what I do here in Buffalo because I love this community. Um, I also love the South Bronx where I'm from and they love me right. too. Right. But I've learned to, to, to be loved. I've learned to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I learned to, to accept the love um, and actually right. call people family. Right. Um, because I used to say people not blood, 
Um, but you don't have to be blood in order to be family. No, right. And actually, here's what I want to say, especially as two of us who are transplantees into Buffalo, and I have, I myself have lived a lot of different places, but it's one, we're one, we are one. We are one. We are one in a way that we just can't, you know, it's one spirit. It's one, you know, so uh, this one world, you know, we're going to sink or swim together. With climate catastrophe, it's not picking and choosing, right? So that our different communities, they're all connected too, you know? So as we move and we build, we're building this, this network. We're building, you know, we're building uh, locally, regionally, well, you're, as you are, nationally and internationally to, to really be working together for the good of all for the people on the planet. And I know you are so engaged in that. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that in spite of all the demands on your time and John Washington waiting for you right now, that <laughs> that you yeah, find the did time because of so community. Yeah, this is this, but this is what we do, right? We sacrifice what we do. time. You know, organizing is not a, a nine to five job. No. Um, this is, organizing is a lifestyle. Um, right. And I'm just glad that um, organizing took me in. Um, after I got trained and understood that I've been organizing money and people my whole life, um, I needed to learn how to be a role model to my son. Um, and that's the way I'm going to die is, is what he remembers me as. And that's going to be a great father and a mentor to many. So Absolutely. No question about it. You do such a wonderful job. You are a great leader. You are the servant of all. Here you are, you because you because I asked you to in the middle of your busy day at now ten o'clock at night. You're still on the on this call with me, and more more work awaiting. Although at least it was it's with a good loving friend. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I want to say, Christian, big hugs and love to you. Um, this is Talking Peace, and together we have been talking peace in truth and love. And peace and love, Vicki. Peace and love Bye. to you. Appreciate you so much. Big hugs and love to you, and give them to him, too. Okay? I will. Yeah. So Bye. you take care. We'll scoot now. No, we won't belong it. Prolong it. It's been like, give him a, yeah. All right. Big I will. Hugs and love Bye. to you all. Bye for now. Bye. Well, that was another good show, I think. God bless him. Poor guy. I know he's